21. Now, we, we will, um, I will talk about baptism a little bit, but if you're saved, the very next thing that the Bible teaches you should do is get baptized. Baptism doesn't get you to heaven. Baptism shows you're on your way to heaven. I use the wedding ring. That's the simplest illustration I know of. Um, if I don't have a wedding ring, I'm still married. And if I put my wedding ring on the hand of one of these guys, if Hunter Zook's got my wedding ring on, it doesn't mean he found a girl dumb enough to marry him, all right? Uh, he's still single. So baptism without salvation means nothing. Salvation without baptism, you're still saved. Just want to understand that. But every person in your New Testament that got saved got baptized, except the thief on the cross because he couldn't. Um, and some of you have had different church backgrounds and um, we'll address this a little bit, but um, you know the word semantics, how do you define words? My family was Lutheran when I was real little. All Norwegian Lutherans came from a community of Norwegian Lutherans. Everybody in McCallsburg in that area of uh, north central Iowa, it's a whole Norwegian area, and if you want to know what a cardinal sin was, I don't know what a cardinal is except a bird, but if you want to know what a real bad sin is, marrying somebody that wasn't a Norwegian. And uh, my mom and my aunt both broke that commandment and married heathen. But, um, but anyway, so you talk to a Norwegian about baptism, they would think sprinkling water on their head. But that's not Bible baptism. Everybody who got baptized in the Bible got baptized underwater. And that, again, that doesn't mean someone's saved or not saved. Salvation is between you and your own heart, your faith in Jesus Christ. But baptism in the Bible has always been underwater. Um, baptism is um, a public thing. And I know people say, I'd like to get baptized, but I don't want anyone to know. That's not what baptism is. That's like me saying I'd like to marry my wife, but I don't want to tell anyone I'm married. That doesn't go over real well with a lady, in case you're wondering. So anyway, today, we're going to talk about two simple words. Well, before I get to the message, in the, on the um, usher's table in the back, two things for the holidays. Um, brother, you're there, Brother Kevin. Would you just hold up one of those big sheets next to you? See these great big sheets back there? We have 120 or so missionaries we support. And there's four sheets back there. If you would like to do something for a missionary family for Christmas, doesn't matter what, something that involves cash because we, we're going to mail them a check, but um, write your name next to a missionary. You don't have to write what you're doing. Last night I put my name down next to Larry Owens. He's been in Argentina for 39 years. Um, lost his wife to cancer a few years ago, was remarried, and got a great church in Argentina. And so I'm going to take some money, put it in one of those Christmas gift envelopes and mark Larry Owens on the envelope, throw it in the offering or in that little offering box back there. And then the church will take care of bundling this money up and getting it to our missionaries with just a note saying, we're just thinking about you for the holidays. Some of these people have three, four, five little children and um, some like Larry and Owens and his wife, their kids are all grown. But that's something you could do for the holiday. Something else you could do, um, there's, I'm sorry, that any envelope will work for the missionaries. There's a Christmas gift for Jesus envelope. That's something if you'd like to do for the church. And we are going to remodel these bathrooms here around the church building. Um, I don't know what's wrong with them. We, 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 what do we do with them? We remodeled them, whatever you want to say, uh, 28 years ago. Uh, but anyway, um, so somebody got the idea. I thought the water goes down when you push the little silver handle. I don't know what the problem is. But uh, have you ever seen a McDonald's that looks like the original McDonald's? They don't. They just don't do it anymore. They, because this worldly generation likes new. But anyhow, as long as you don't want a new pastor, I'm okay with it. <laughs> so um, if you'd like to give something to the Lord for, for Christmas... 
Um, we've got to, and we're just going to do one restroom and one little room, big one, depending how much money comes in. We're just going to start redoing, and that's something you can do. All right, okay, done with that. Let's get to the Bible. We're a little behind this morning. Numbers 21. Let's stand just for a moment, stretch your legs. Numbers chapter 21, and uh, we'll get, read a couple of verses. Numbers 21, and look down at verse 4. Numbers 21, verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. Remember, they just left Egypt, the story of the Exodus. They crossed the Red Sea. And I'm in the middle of verse 4 now. To compass or to circle the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because the elections went so bad. (laughs) That's in the original Hebrew to get that. They were discouraged because of the way. How many of you ever felt like the way was hard? You ever feel like the way is hard? You betcha. Um, any of you guys think it's hard? Wait, you know, just, you know, have a baby. You'll find out. And we didn't know that for 6,000 years that couldn't happen. But now that liberalism is in charge, it can. Nobody, that's a big stupid lie. But anyhow, verse 5. And the people spake against God. And that's not the sermon, but I'll tell you, just because you're having problems... God's the one you better not speak against. Of all people, we ought to give God thanks. And we ought to give God his glory. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. Now God had given them bread. Remember every day the bread manna came down from heaven. You know what? They didn't like God's bread provision that's really need to think through that thing and uh, well not a very smart thing if God gave it to us we ought to thank him for it I'm not saying I'm a perfect Christian we ought to verse 6 and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died therefore the people came to Moses and said we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord, isn't it great? Moses prayed for the people who spoke against him. There you go. There's a real Christian. (laughs) They don't make them anymore, by the way. (laughs) Uh, Verse 8, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, a brass serpent, all right? And set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Father, help us as we look at your book today. Teach us and uh, may we have things clear in our hearts about this matter of salvation and Christian living. Help please, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Look at that verse. I'm gonna run through just real quick, very short Um, simple lesson. If you look at verse four, verse four, it was difficult. It was difficult. And life is difficult. Car accident, sickness. Um, Our our young people were at a tournament, spent the week at a best of the West tournament, basketball and volleyball up in Sacramento area. And and, uh, the girls got third place and the boys got first place. And then, and then about half of them got something else they brought home, but I'm not going to talk about that. But then on the way home on Friday, they, uh, they spent the day with one of our young men, spent, grew up here, Caleb Beal, he's pastoring in Turlock, and they spent uh, the day passing out flyers and witnessing, inviting people to have, have be a part of a big day that they're having at their church. And then they got home last night and on bus routes and busy this morning, but congratulations, young people. But to be a success in sports, it's a difficult way. You have to run, you have to work, you have to practice. And nobody likes to practice, but everybody likes to win. And it's just a fact. So the Christian life is hard. So number one in verse four, a difficult path, hard path. Number two, look at verse five. They spoke against God. And when you complain, if you go over to chapter seven, some, or chapter 11, you don't have to go there now. It says, and the people complained and the Lord heard it. You know, when people complain, God hears God hears. Don't let your kids complain. You sit down at a table and some kid says, we're eating that. Make that what they eat the rest of the month. Tell them as soon as you can sit down at the table 
and look at your mama and say thank you for the broccoli, we'll stop having it. I would suggest you say it immediately. <laughs> and then you never have to eat that stuff again. Um, anyway, so that gratitude. Don't let your kids... Don't let your kids grow up complaining. Now, one of the things that helps if mom and dad quit griping. All right? Now, dads don't complain, but you know how those complain. <laughs> anyway, never mind. Uh, no, we complain. We complain about all kinds of things. And stop it. There's a God in heaven. Complaining never fixed anything. You know, yelling at the ref never fixed anything. It's just so fun. Uh, all right, we... Young people, don't do that. That's bad. All right, I got through the whole last game, only yelled at the ref once. That wasn't bad. All right, so verse 7, uh, I'm sorry, verse 6, God sent poisonous snakes to bite the people, and they're dying, all right? There's a whole lot to that, but the, God's mad about it. He sent a bunch of poisonous snakes. Verse 7, the people came to Moses begging for help. And, oh, there's so many good things. Verse 8. Verse 8, God told Moses, make a brass or a fiery serpent, put it in a pole, and lift it up so it could be easily seen. You know the this, this symbol in the medical world still is a serpent wrapped around a pole? That's from the Word of God. It's from Numbers 21. And it's a reminder that only God can truly heal. And any medicine, any healing in the hands of a doctor, if that doctor's honest, he will tell you that it's God who works through him. And God uses people. We're certainly thankful for all the medical help. I know when I go to the dentist, I like, uh, I like double shots of Novocaine. Just give me all I can get. I don't mind if I drool for three days. I just don't like pain. But um, he raised that serpent up. So he's got a pole, and he wrapped that brass serpent around it, and he put it up there real high. And then if, now, how many people? Two or three million people. That's a lot of people. That would be Escondido all the way to Riverside. All, that's a big city. One serpent. How come they didn't make 10? Because that serpent's a picture, that, that pole and the brass serpent's a picture of Jesus. We'll see in a minute in John chapter 3. And Jesus, there's only one Savior. Not 10 Saviors, there's one Savior. Uh, nobody died for your sins but Jesus. And so uh, there's one, one, uh, only one serpent there raised up. But look at verse 9, that if a serpent had bitten any man, any man, this is we're talking about all people, when he beheld the, bre the serpent of brass, he lived. Very, very simple story. And you might say, I don't understand. Why would God do something weird like that? I would just kill all the people and start over. But, all right, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And again, this story is familiar to most of you, but today we want to take a couple of minutes and make sure that we, we have a clear understanding of this thing. What did they have to do to get healed of their sickness? John, chapter 3. We got just look, right? This, this thing work? No. Yeah, it does work. How about that? So if I, got, if I was dying, all I had to do was look. Did it say I had to go to Sunday school? How about I have to join the church? Um, count beads. Light candles. Um, run around the block three times saying, you know, stand in a corner with a Watchtower magazine. No, all I had to do was believe in my heart enough to go look. That's all. That's all. I didn't have to quit smoking. All right, if you look to the brass serpent and you don't cuss no more, then say that. If you don't gripe at your wife and her burning your breakfast anymore, then say that. Just look the song in your hymnal, look and live. Look, that's it, look. Now, this is illustrating salvation. So, John chapter 3. Look at John chapter 3 and verse... Now, remember in John 3, he's talking earlier to Nicodemus. This is where this story of you must be born again comes from. And it's not in my Bible because I'm in Mark. Whew. John 3 is not in Mark. Now we're in John chapter 3. 
Uh, verse 1, there's an, a ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus. And he came to Jesus and started talking to him. Jesus said, you must be born again. And they argued, he argues with Jesus a little bit. And in verse 7, he says, marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. And Nicodemus couldn't quite understand. What does this born again thing mean? I don't understand it. <laughs> Much learning makes you an idiot. Some of you that are real deep studiers, be very careful. It can make you stupid faster than you can believe. Uh, just read your Bible, love it, and believe it, all right? Now, we'll go down a little bit further. So since this guy that was so educated could not understand the new birth, Jesus said, let me tell you a story. Back in the days of Moses, they were complaining, and there was poisonous snake sent all right so look there if you would at john 3 verse 14 john 3 14 as moses lifted up the what serpent he's pointing back that story as moses lifted up the serpent you might want to write in the margin of your bible if you don't have a reference bible write uh, uh numbers 21 there it'll remind you how to find it again as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up so just like the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must Jesus be lifted up. Then look at that next phrase, verse 15, that who? What? Who, 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 what? Who's on first? That whosoever, whosoever, right? That's anybody. Anybody. I mean, that's people from South America and North America and the Arctic and the Antarctic and Europe and doesn't matter. Whosoever. That who, so you say, I don't feel very religious. We're not worried about you being religious. We're worried about you getting saved. So I'm struggling with some sin. Who isn't? I'll introduce you to a savior who will help you get some victory though. That whosoever, look at verse 15, just like that serpent was lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? E e eternal life in verse 15. Then he repeats himself in verse 16. For this is why that serpent was the serpent in Numbers 21. That was clear back in the Exodus 2000 BC. That story clear back here. God let that happen for one reason. So that when J Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he could say, I want to explain how easy it is to get saved. Just one thing. Just look. John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what kind of life? Everlasting. Everlasting life. Now, John 3, 16 all by itself is pretty good at explaining it, but when you put that story of the serpent in there, that's real clear. Yeah, amen. That is as clear as it can possibly be, that whosoever. Now, let me explain something. A couple of quick things. If today... You said, you know what, I'm not very religious and I'm not a very good person, but I know I'm a sinner and I know sin is going to condemn me to hell. And I want to be saved. If you will put your faith in Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth, if you'll believe what Jesus did for you on the cross, if you'll put your faith in Christ, you will not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. What's he talking about? John 3, 6, he's talking about being born again. So if today you walked in here this morning or you're listening online and you're not sure about heaven and you know you're a sinner and you believe Jesus died for you and you're willing to put your faith in Christ and just, just like looking at that brass serpent say, I believe, look, here's two people back in Numbers 21 and they both got bit by the serpent and the one guy says, I'm going to go find that brass serpent of Moses so I can get healed. Another guy says, oh, I don't believe that. I believe in evolution. I don't believe that. I mean, there's so many different religions. How can you know which one's right? And the other guy says, I don't know what you think, but I'm going to find that serpent. And I'm, going to, I'm going to look and live. And you know what? The one that got healed is the one who believed. The one who got healed and the one who had life was the one who looked. And Jesus says... And as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth. You don't have to be a Baptist to get saved. You just have to be a Baptist to be a decent Christian. No, I'm, jo <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you don't have to go to a certain church to get saved. You've got to put your faith in Christ. You look to him, 
Not to the church, not to the pope, not to the priest, not to the rabbi. Look to Jesus. Jesus is willing to save you. Simple as that. There, now look, so if I come in here today, or you're listening to this online, and you, you realize you need to get saved, and then you put your faith in Christ, then you're saved, right? What kind of life do you have? Everlasting, Everlasting life. All right, now what? This is the important part. If I go back 24 hours... Did I have everlasting life? If today you put your faith in Christ, that means today you have everlasting life. So what did you have yesterday? Death. You didn't have everlasting life. So first of all, you thought the sermon was over. There is a time and a place when you get saved. I was born... On May 27th, you might want to write that down in your calendar. <laughs> Put a five-day reminder on it. 1957. Whew, thank you, Phil. I appreciate that. In Des Moines, Iowa. You know what? If you want to know about my birth, I think it was the middle of the night, as I remember. It was dark. <laughs> anyway. But from what my mom told me, is the middle of the night, and it was May 27th, 1957, in the hospital in Des Moines, Iowa. I was born in a place. I was born at a time. I was born to a couple. That's where I was born. Fast forward 18 years. August 28th, 1975, in a city park. A guy explained this that I'm talking about. And I said, I want that. And I bowed my head and asked the Lord to save me. And on August 28th, 10, 15 at night, in the city park, in the metropolis of Hayfork, California, where everybody had a pickup and everybody had a hunting rifle in the back of the pickup, a chainsaw, and if you had a hunting rifle, a pickup, and a girlfriend, you were really something. And if she wasn't your cousin, but anyhow. <laughs> we were country. I mean, if you didn't hunt deer and catch salmon, you were probably a newbie, a newbie in the community, all right? And if you didn't have at least four broken down vehicles in your front yard. So I could tell how long someone had lived there by how many pieces of heavy equipment wouldn't run in their yard. And no housing track, but everybody had acreage. But, but anyway, so on August 27th, 1975, I was on my way to hell. On August 28th, I was on my way to heaven. I was born again. So there is a time when you get born, and there's a time when you get born again. There's a place you get born, and you may not remember where it was, but you know that you were, right? I mean, Tim Smith's back here. I, I held Tim Smith in the church nursery. That's how I got my back injury. Um, and uh, we had some kind of a ladies' meeting going on. I'm, I'm picking that baby. I think, man, the biggest baby I ever held in my life. And... Um, and, but there was a time, I remember when Tim was born, and uh, there was a time, I don't know when, but there's a time, there's a place when you're born. There is a moment called salvation. So if today, if today you're thinking, I think I'm saved, well, either you are or you're not. And you may have gotten saved in your youth or as a young adult, maybe you've gotten away and you don't have any real assurance because you don't have enough Bible in your You've not read the word of God enough to really understand it all. I'm not saying you're not saved. That's totally between you and God. But if you're not sure you're saved, I would urge you to get saved. And get reading your Bible. Because this is the book right here that will give you assurance of salvation. Um, my, uh, you know, somebody runs away from home, never sees their family for 20 years. They might doubt that they're loved, but they don't know what's in their parents' heart. Those parents could be aching for them to come back. But they don't know because they're so far away. They don't know. And you may be saved and not know. But I, I would encourage you to get saved. Now, in just those few verses, a couple verses here in Numbers 21, a couple verses here in John, I just explained real simply how to get saved. We could use the thief on the cross. We could use the Philippian jailer. Salvation's just, salvation, look, is a little, little, tiny piece of your Bible. But look at all that. You know what all that is? That's how to make God happy. explain 
I stood in a church like this. My wife stood at the back door with her daddy. She walked down the aisle and stood there. The preacher said, who gives away this woman? He said, her mother and I do. I walked down, took my wife by the arm. We walked up here. There's the preacher. Here's my wife and I. And I said, I do. And she said, I do. And at that moment, we were married. Hallelujah. And for the next 41 years, we've been working at a good marriage. You know how long it took to get married? Moments. You know how long it takes to have a successful marriage? The rest of your life. Sometimes the journey is hard. <laughs> so when you get saved, your salvation is instantaneous. It's simple. But the rest of your Christian life, you're reading your Bible and you're trying to honor the Bible, not to get saved because you already got saved. You're reading your Bible and trying to live in a way to make your father happy. Because when you get saved, you're now in a family. And your heavenly father gave you a book so you'd know how to act and please your father. The mistake is this. When people say, you have to keep all the Bible in order to be saved. Does that make sense? I'm trying to keep this real simple here. How about, let me put it in the marriage symbol. Here, my daughter, son and daughter-in-law, Josh and Carly, been married, how long, 15, 17 years? 16 years ago, they got married right here. And if I said, you're not really married unless you're a really good husband and a really good wife. And so the whole rest of their life, they're trying to get married. Does that make sense? No, I said, they got married. I saw them. I saw them right here. They got three kids. They're married. They got a house over here a couple miles away. The last 16 years, they've been working at being a good husband and a good wife and having a good marriage. But marriage was instant. It's the quality of marriage you work on. And so when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, see, these churches all over are telling people, if you don't be good, you're not a Christian. How good? How good? I've yet to meet one of them to tell me how good I've got to be to be a Christian. Well, you've got to be sincere. How sincere? Now, I've told the story here. I got to sit for an hour with the Catholic priest many years ago. And I said, and he didn't know I was a preacher. And I didn't tell him otherwise. I just sat, I got, got some questions. I said, how, do, how can I know for sure I'm forgiven? He said, just keep the commandments. I said, oh, <laughs> that's done. I broke a bunch of them. And he said, well, I understand. You just want to do your best. I said, I don't always do my best. Some days I really couldn't care less. He said, well, I understand. But you just want to be sincere. And I, I sh maybe I shouldn't have said it. I said, the way girls dress in the summer, I'm not always real sincere. Now, that's a summary of an hour-long conversation. At the end of the hour, the priest at St. Francis of Rome probably different way now. He was pretty old then. He said to me, Bruce, I'm not sure myself I'm going to heaven. And I've told that story all over the valley when I meet Catholic people. I was witnessing to a guy in his front yard. He's watering his plants and I'm just talking to him about the life. I said, you know, I met your, pa I met your priest, really. Yeah, I told him that story. He said, get off my property or I'm going to wet you with my hose. <laughs> I said, you better get something more hope than, more hope than that priest got. You're going you're gonna to need that water hose where you're going. You know how you get saved? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. It's simple. Look and live. Well, what do I have to do? Just believe. Well, what do I have to do? I just said it. Believe. Well, how good do I have to be? Did anybody say be good? Is the word good anywhere in that verse? What are we throwing good in there for? Well, how much do you have to go to church? None. Yep, right. You come to Jesus to get saved. You go to church to please him. Amen. Not to get saved. Right. How much Bible do I have to read to get saved? Well, it's like how many 
marriage books as Josh and Carly have to read to be married. They're married. I think good books on marriage will help them have a happier marriage. Help her understand how weird guys are. Help, you know, the other's obvious. <laughs> how much Bible do you need to read to be a good Christian? The rest of your life. Why? Because God is so complex. And someone says, I've been reading it, I just don't understand it. Just keep reading it. Just keep reading it. Do I have to read it to get saved? Stop putting words in my mouth. You don't have to do anything to get saved. Are we all in agreement on that? Look and live. John 3, 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, he says in Romans 10, look, this morning, all of this Bible, most of this Bible is written to help you and me know how to live. So God looks down from heaven and says, ah, look at my kids. Look what good kids they are. Isn't that what you are as a parent? Tell your kids you want them to do this or that. Tell your your, uh, your teacher, tell the kids in the school, do this homework, do that homework, read these pages. You know what you, That's not to make them your student. They're already your student. That's to make them a good student. And I heard somebody one day say, well, I don't know if I'm a good Christian. I said, well, that's between you and God, none of my business. Well, what do I have to do to be a good Christian? Well, spend the rest of your life reading your Bible. Surrender to God. Love God. Love people when they're jerks. Love God when you don't like what he's done. That's what it takes to be a good Christian. But to be a child of God, to be born into the family, it's instant. It's just like that. And this baptistry, this uh, the idea of, of getting baptized, it's just the first thing you can do, like a wedding ring, to just say, hey world, I've trusted Jesus. And I'm glad I'm a Christian and I'm not embarrassed. And so the one who hung on the cross and he was buried and he rose three days later, I love him. Amen. And I've already put my faith in him. I'm already saved. And today I'm just getting baptized to make sure folks know I love him. Right. Pretty simple. Now, if you're not sure you're saved this morning, I'd invite you to trust Christ today so what do i have to do just believe well i think i already believe well the devil believes in god you're going to put your faith in christ you're going to say i'm willing to trust jesus to save me and if you've got that faith in your heart i'd love to have one of our men or ladies just take a moment and pray with you up here and then you say what about baptism well you get saved when you put your faith in christ baptism is what you do to show the world you made that inside decision. All right, so in the room this morning, I have no idea where you are, but I want to urge you, make your decision. You might say, I don't know if I want to be around. I don't know if I want to be a, you know, part of that. Oh, that's right, you don't have to. It's like you don't have to be married. But it's a good life. All right, let's pray. Father, bless us, help us today. We are grateful for the simplicity of salvation. Like the serpent in the wilderness, just look and believe and they got well and jesus offers us salvation freely and then he gives us a great book that'll teach us how to live day by day the rest of our lives to make our heavenly father happy bless your people today may we love your book and live it and if someone here's not sure they're saved i pray they get saved those who've been saved ready to get baptized uh, they could do if they got saved today, they could get baptized today. That's what happened in your New Testament. So help your people to make the choices that would please you in Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand for a moment with our heads bowed. You just take a moment alone.